So uh, I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things, megatrend, what it means, and the value of the data infrastructure with these new connected things. Yeah? As I mentioned a um, market principal. I'm based in San Leandro in our headquarters. I talked a little bit about my background in Microsoft and the automotive industry. And about four years ago, I, uh, I got more interested in connecting vehicles, doing a lot of telematics, you know, connected vehicle operations with Microsoft. Uh, obviously, Microsoft was on the embedded side, but uh, also leveraging cloud technology for the back end of the vehicles. So that's kind of what got me interested in all the other things in manufacturing that can be connected. So uh, the agenda I have is talk a little bit about what is the Internet of Things. There's a lot of definitions, a lot of marketing, a lot of hype. I will also talk about a little bit about the heterogeneous landscape. It's uh, the value chain and, and made up from many different participants and companies. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the value scenarios that uh, around energy manufacturing, transportation, a little bit about smart city. But uh, hopefully you'll recognize that as OSI Soft, we've been, we've been working with the Internet of Things for 35 years by these definitions. And then if we have time, hopefully this time, we can take some questions or happy to take some questions after the session since we've got some time. Big trends, right? I think you will recognize these things. The explosion of the number of devices that are becoming more intelligent. So by that, we mean that they have connectivity. They either have embedded connectivity or they're leveraging kind of internet connectivity. Um, either telecommunication or satellite communications, the different types of communication. So that pervasiveness of connectivity, the increase in the number of devices, but also the piece that drives the data is the increasing number of sensors and the sensors getting smaller. So you can put them in, in many things, like your a, a Samsung phone that may have multiple sensors on there, whether it's proximity sensors or accelerometer information or gyroscope information. So lots of devices, more connectivity, more sensors in the devices, generates a lot of data. Right? And the other thing that, that's interesting is the cost of storage of data is going down, right? and the cost of computing cycles is going down. So these, all these kind of trends moving in unison is creating a, a lot of data being exchanged by these devices. So in terms of definition, <clears throat> so I, I, I like this definition that talks about a virtual representation of a physical object in an internet-like structure. Right? That's a pretty general definition, right? but it really fits the industrial environment that we've been working in for 35 years. We've been connecting devices and getting data from these devices for, you know, for many, many years. So we start with the, the kind of the device piece, right? Now in the industrial side, it's a machine, right? But it can also be a vehicle, a truck, a train. And it can also kind of transcend into the consumer side, right? Not just your mobile phone, but also connecting your home and the, all of these devices with this connectivity. I mentioned the connectivity. Again, you see the telecommunications increasing uh, their capabilities. You see more different types of connectivity, lighter protocols, being able to send the data, get the data from the device. And then they, they send them to a back-end environment, whether it's a big data environment or just a, another place in the cloud where you're accumulating a lot of sensor data. So devices, lots of sensors, transmitted up via some form of connectivity, up into a cloud-like environment, lots of data, you start doing analysis on the data, you make a recommendation or you do some, come to some conclusion, and you bring that value back to where the device is. That's this loop. And again, you know, lots of lots of devices and lots of lots of environments. The concepts have been around for a while, but what's changing is the technology, you know, getting more sophisticated. So I pulled up a little a survey from uh, Forrester Research to understand which geographies are doing Internet of Things initiatives. 
in the IC in Asia Pacific, 70% of the people that were interviewed right, say they are either implementing or they have an Internet of Things initiative. Right? There's something going on in the region here, uh, obviously more than North America and Europe. The two kind of areas that people talk about are around smart cities, around buildings, infrastructure, transportation scenarios. And so a lot of city infrastructure is building this connectivity. Right? You're attracting more people to the city, you're leveraging this connectivity and this technology. So that's one of them. But the other one that I like is the one on the bottom there, which is the industrial side of, of the Internet of Things. I show a little semiconductor manufacturing, but it's really all types of manufacturing that has more equipment, more sensors in it. It's also used in the supply chain, right? So you start tracking things in a value chain. So these are kind of the two big areas driving it. And, and I believe that you'll, you'll probably see a lot of that in Asia Pacific and here in Korea. So let's talk about this heterogeneous landscape. So we start with some of the challenges that enterprise are facing as they're trying to implement an, inter uh, an Internet of Things scenario. The first one that you talk about is integration. And I'll talk about that one in, in the next slide in terms of the integration. But uh, I want to talk about the costs. So the question is, do I use my money to build up the infrastructure and then hope that I have the right scenario to make a business case? Or do I find the right use case and then hope that I can build the infrastructure to support it? Right? Not sure. Right? What's the answer? So we're hoping that with cloud capabilities and commercial models that you can use pay-as-you-go type of infrastructure, the elasticity, so you can try different scenarios and you can be more agile. Right? You need that agility right, to, to kind of conform to the market. So you need flexible infrastructures to support these things because you just don't know. Right? And also the business models. You know, there's a lot of customers that we talk to and they want to do these type of initiatives, but they're just not sure what the business model is. Right? So they're kind of figuring it out. And that's why you need some of that flexibility. You can't talk about the Internet of Things without talking about the data and the privacy. <laughs> Who owns the data? especially as it's being transmitted between multiple companies and the possibility that it's personal data somewhere along the way. Right? So there's the, another concern. The IT governance. Where do we invest in these initiatives? What part of the value chain? So what happens is you know, somebody's going to get a benefit and somebody has to pay the cost. And sometimes they're not the same person. <laughs> so lining up how we, we, we organize these investments in technology. Uh, the lack of standards, whether it's protocols or, or interfaces, data structures, Less. because there's a lack of standards, it makes it another challenging aspect of trying to implement one of these, these type of solutions right? in the city and in, in, in the industrial environment. Let me talk about the integration challenge. When, when they're trying to deliver an Internet of Things solution, and if we start on the left-hand side with the, the actual device and the chip on the device, right, then you start talking about the connectivity and then the control of the data infrastructure, the integration component, how you distribute that end device. Is it through a retail channel? Is it somebody has to buy the hardware? What is the life cycle of the hardware? And then, of course, the important part of the whole scenario is delivering the value-added services on top of these connected things. And not one company does all of these components. So different companies are doing different pieces of this, and you have to try to stitch it all together, right? A different telco, maybe it's a different type of uh, chipset, an Intel or a Qualcomm. So, our belief is that the common layer throughout that value chain is the data that flows from the sensors on the device through these different pieces. It's the data that goes along the way 
accumulating context along the way, right? Information about the equipment, where it was captured at the time. And then people building applications on top of that data infrastructure, right? Innovating applications on top of a data infrastructure. Now, if that doesn't sound like what OSI has been doing for 35 years, right? is we provided a data infrastructure, people have used it to have visibility to the data, and then derive applications. So whether it's a service application, or it's a remote monitoring type of application, because this is kind of the general pattern. So at OSIsoft, and you've been listening to some of our, our customer stories and, and technology, you know, traditionally we've been sitting there Pi, you've got interfaces to bring the data in, and then you have a lot of capability to look at the data. We have a, we have a push to getting closer to the edge. That means getting closer to the device, bringing the interface of the data closer to the source where it's being generated. And we, we've, we've done some exploratory work with some semiconductor manufacturers, some chip manufacturers, like an Intel and a Qualcomm, um, where we've kind of looked to capture data closer, right? The problem with that is it has less context, right? It becomes raw data. Right? But we're working with them, especially getting to a gateway type of scenario, right? Uh, again, if you look at the gateways that are out there, there's all kinds of gateways. Gateways in the home, gateways you know, out in public infrastructure. So I think the gateway environment is still very mixed, but OSI, we're working towards getting closer to that gateway and closer to the device, if we can. Um, we also uh, publicly uh, uh, announced some work that we were doing, exploratory work, with Cisco, um, where Cisco actually talks about the area between the device and the cloud, and they call it in the middle, they call it the fog. And this fog uh, is where we put we put some interface technology there to see if we can capture data uh, with that integrated networking device. It was around a connected grid router. It's in, uh, it was talked about at uh, an industry event uh, on transmission and distribution. If you look to the right of that, right, we've also been working with customers towards cloud technology. I don't know if you may have heard a little bit of some of the Cloud Connect capability as a starting point but also working with customers to have Pi running in their private cloud environment and their public cloud environment. And we believe that there isn't going to be one cloud in the world. There's going to be many clouds. So the ability to exchange data between these different clouds will be important. So as you see, as OSI, you see us getting closer to the edge, and you see us working on leveraging some of the capabilities that the cloud enables us to do for scalability and for elasticity as well. So I'll give you a, another example. And this is, I think this relationship is several years old, but it illustrates the point. Rockwell Automation, right, in terms of building hardware and controllers and industrial automation, uh, embedding Pi in Rockwell Automation so that we're closer to the source where the data is. So this was an example where they put Pi on that backplane so that they can get uh, eliminate some of the latency in, in putting the, the systems far away so that it's, it's closer to the source. So this is a relationship we've had for a few years as an example. It's real and, and, and it's out there functioning today. They, I think there's about 3,000 customers uh, running Pi uh, with Rockwell. The other thing, I mentioned the cloud and the elasticity. Yeah? And I mentioned the importance of the service provider, right? delivering a service to this connected device, right? That's where the value is, right? These, these services and the elasticity. So one of the things that, that we're doing is it, it, we're working with connected services providers. What does that mean, right? The definition is a company that's trying to deliver aftermarket services, either consulting services or aftermarket services on a piece of equipment, right? In terms of monitoring or SLA or, or collecting data. So we're working with these companies that are delivering services into industrial environments, and we're working with them in a commercial model where we can do subscription-based pricing, pay-as-you-go-based pricing. So therefore, 
uh, we're, we're, we're initially working to enable our existing technology in a subscription model for these service providers. Obviously, uh, our technology moving to the cloud will also facilitate that elasticity, but initially we're doing it with a commercial model. And happy to talk to anyone interested in some of these connected services scenarios. Uh, we've got quite a few stories. So what are the scenarios? So I mentioned on the lower right-hand corner of the picture, the asset owner or someone running this connected machine or device, right? you know, sharing their data and exposing their data. This is something that we've always encouraged customers to do. It's, the, it's our customer's data and being able to share that through the supply chain or the value chain for the benefit of receiving these valuable services. So uh, you see in the picture, it can be a supplier like an equipment supplier or a chemical supplier. Um, it may be a pure service provider. And it could be an ESRI, a geospatial type of service, um, an operations and ma maintenance partner. So we've always en encouraged that exchange of data. And the value scenarios there are remote monitoring. Right? The ability, that you, I, I can't understand Korean, but I saw the picture of the remote center, remote monitoring center in the previous page. Yeah? That's, we see that happening with companies where they want to remotely monitor their own, but we also see them leveraging third-party companies to help them with the remote monitoring center. Just economies of scale, right? The second one is we're seeing a change in the way people are interested in buying their equipment or their assets. Instead of buying with a big capital investment, they may want to purchase that equipment as a subscription, as a service. So instead of buying a truck, a heavy industrial truck, they could buy it as a service, transportation as a service, where the manufacturer manages the truck and the service, and they, they sign a, a long-term contract, 20 years or something. So these type of relationships are enabled because the truck is connected and it has sensors and they're getting data to be able to monitor it. Monitoring things like tire pressures on trucks, right? make sure that a, a tire is performing its best uh, conditions. I mentioned the value-added services, and these are varying. Uh, again, people are opening up uh, platforms so that they get innovation of new services. Right? Of course, you know, there's the risk of exposing the data, but there's the value of getting these innovative services from, from different, uh, different people. Right? So they're, they're, they're receptive to that. We've got a, a story with a, a wind turbine operator that's exposing data so that they can innovate, as an example. So what are the market ones, right? Obviously, the energy sector is big on the Internet of Things in terms of you know, meters and a lot of instrumentation and sensors on the grid itself, right, for stability. There's the smart factory or the smart operations piece in terms of the gaining, gaining efficiency. There's the transportation and logistics. Right? On more of the consumer side, we mentioned the cities. I mentioned the home. There's also the retail space as well. Lots of instrumentation, lots of sensors. And then there's obviously the healthcare one, remote monitoring. There's a nice story uh, that we were working with a, a company in Canada that was instrumenting uh, professional athletes, hockey players, uh, and they were monitoring for uh, making an evaluation of energy uh, consumption and, and de depreciation of the performance. Right? So, I mean, instrumenting people, right, is another form of assets. So now let me give you some customer examples. And these are, these are on our website. They're customer stories. They present at our regional events. I just handpicked a few of them. There's, a, there's quite a few different ones, but ones I particularly like, right? And this one was around wind energy. And, and, I, and I know it's uh, a lot of reading in there, but again, you can reference the, the story on our website. Uh, they're a turbine manufacturer. Obviously, with controls on the turbine, there's a lot of data within the turbine that they were they were using some of the data to monitor the turbine, but they realized there wasn't enough data coming off of the turbine so that they could diagnose problems. They could just hear that they could see that there was a problem, but they couldn't get into the actual root cause of the problem. So by getting into the automation, they would they would expose. For, they went from exposing I think like 70 tags to about 1,200 tags. Now they, they didn't use all of them. They didn't capture all of them, 
but they had access to this data. And they were able to then establish the remote monitoring and diagnostic center, take advantage of this turbine data, offer services to their customer where they can remotely monitor these turbines on the wind farm. You know, it's ideal, right, because it's the equipment manufacturer. In reality, right, there's many different turbine manufacturers, and it's a very heterogeneous environment, right? Different turbines, different protocols. But the concept is there, right? Sensor data, the machine, the connectivity back, the analysis, the recommendation coming forward. Here's another one that I, I particularly like. This is a chemical company. Uh, it's a Nalco. Uh, Ecolab company, Nalco Champion Ecolab company. Um, and what they were doing, again, uh, you, you can look at the story, they've spoken at our users' conferences as well. They're providing specialty chemicals. Right? And what they were doing was they had different types of customers consuming those chemicals. There's a predominance in oil and gas and refining. Uh, they were in data centers. They're, they're in a lot of different industries. And what they did was they made investments in developing their own sensing technology something they call 3D Trazar. It's a brand name. But they put these sensors in at their customer site so that they can monitor chemistry, and they would bring that data back into Nalco. They would have expertise about how the chemicals were performing. They were able to then provide a recommendation back to, 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 to their customer to show them how they could optimize the chemical plant. And uh, the other benefits, or the other things they noticed, right, was two-thirds of their company were field service, going out to capture this data from this piece of equipment. So by leveraging this technology, they're able to then reduce the amount of trips that their field service goes out to capture the data, right? So instead of going out, diagnosing, and coming back, they could look at data and go out to the equipment only when they needed to go. But the other thing for them as a chemical company was they could see the performance of their chemicals on, say, a heat exchanger right, for corrosion. They could look at all the heat exchangers within a particular oil and gas company, but they could look at the performance of their chemicals across all the companies that they supported for heat exchangers. So they were able to provide context now to their customer of how the chemical was performing, but also identify which ones were not performing as well as other ones so that they can take a look at them and improve the efficiency. So always working on the lower performing one and making it better. So I really liked this story because it was a pattern that started to repeat, right? Sensor data on the, uh, at the source, bringing it back and providing value. So we, we talked about the mobile assets, right? And uh, we've talked about uh, you know, a little bit about the heavy indus industrial truck. Uh, we've, we've got initiatives with trains on the rolling stock, obviously in, con in conjunction with the infrastructure that they roll on. Uh, we've got customer stories around uh, ships, where they're, they're doing maintenance on ships and pulling data back into the port. So all of these mobile type of devices, uh, again, different types of connectivity bringing the data back. Right? Uh, we've got companies like uh, Kongsberg in, uh, in Europe that's doing monitoring, uh, providing a monitoring service for, for ships. Um, so th there's a lot of kind of, a lot of activity around these large moving assets and providing these type of valuable services. Won't go into too much detail here, but the architectural pattern of us putting a Pi interface either on board of these devices or we, or the customer brings the data back and we grab it from there. Right? So it's either an interface at the end that is brought back into Pi, or we're able to put an onboard Pi system. Uh, we've done this on, on some interesting vessels, right? large ships, but also on some performance boats as well uh, in Florida and the United States. And uh, now the ability to bring back that data from a Pi system to another Pi system, we're leveraging kind of our Pi Cloud Connect technology to exchange data back and forth. So this is a customer story again. You can go see these presentations, Caterpillar, right? Millions of assets out in the field, their equipment being used in a lot of different industries. 
Uh, and what they were doing is they were bringing back data from their engines and their trucks in, in different business units, but the engines, uh, they would bring back the engine data and they'd be able to apply their expertise and be able to make recommendations on service or assist in troubleshooting. Okay? Yeah, the only tricky part about this one was they sell through their dealerships. So it's Caterpillar, the dealership, the end customer. So you had to navigate some of that uh, uh, commercial aspect. But the monitoring of engines, right? lots of sensor data, it's not, it's not uh, relational data. It's not a big data Hadoop environment. It, it, it has to look as time series data for these engines. So they're able to see temperature differences in the exhaust, or they're able to detect uh, misfires and combustion and poor quality, those type of things. A little bit about the smart city. Um, so we have initiatives with, uh, with like San Diego. I think uh, it showed up on the Esri video. You saw the airport. Uh, and really our approach has been to go to these different industrial portions of the city with the vision that we're going to enable them to exchange data back and forth. Right? And again, it's around connected sensors in all of these type of leveraging the sensors in the city infrastructure, as well as some of the sensor data in some of the, uh, the utilities and uh, gas and electric infrastructure, as an example. Uh, the example here is some work that we're doing with universities, uh, Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and PNC Bank. Right? This is where the university So Carnegie Mellon University, what they were doing was just build it out. Uh, they instrumented one of their buildings so that they can capture data within the building, so, and also getting some of the equipment data, whether it's uh, heating and cooling equipment or temperature sensor data. Uh, and they brought this data back, and they were trying to optimize for energy efficiency. So what they noticed was, obviously, they can look at more efficient hardware and, and exchange that. But what they noticed as well is the operating pattern, right? So obviously, turning things down when people aren't in the building, and very fundamental kind of basic things. It doesn't sound like very complicated. But they were able to kind of demonstrate a 30% reduction in energy consumption by doing, leveraging some of these, these simple techniques, right? Operating pattern and looking at the data. And they, what they also did was they presented the data to the users, the, op, the, the people who were in the buildings, and the, the facilities managers. So by just providing that visibility of the sensor data, they could gain some of these improvements. Right? And what they did was then they started working out in the private sector. And this is where they were talking to a bank that was looking to do energy in their individual facilities. So they're able to, the university is able to leverage kind of their their experience and their knowledge, and apply it into a commercial environment with a bank right, and facilities. So this is, this is the kind of the, the work here. And then the, the last one I particularly like around the smart city. I like baseball. And uh, we were doing some work with uh, Major League Baseball in the United States. And uh, they were monitoring the, 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 the infrastructure in the baseball stadium, right? the water, the energy consumption. They built these dashboards with all the sensor technology, and you go to the stadium and then you could see you know, the energy consumption, yeah? But there, were, uh, there was a stadium in Seattle that had the retractable roof that opens and closes, and uh, they were like, we need to monitor this roof because it's probably gonna consume a lot of energy and we need to optimize when we open and close the roof. But you know, with this presentation, he says, we looked at the energy consumption and it was, I think, less than $5 to open and close the roof. <laughs> $5. So now kids are just opening and closing the roof on the stadium. Right? This is just by having visibility, by having that sensor data, showing people what it really is and, and how it can be optimized. That's where you get the benefit. So our Pi customers have been doing this for a while right? in the automation space, bringing sensor data up into a data infrastructure and obviously with using an enterprise agreement, they have Pi systems at multiple locations. They now kind of have a second tiered architecture where they roll some of that data up to look across of these different business units, different manufacturing facilities, diff uh, different scenarios. And they're bringing se the sensor data, this Internet of Things sensor data, not just into that industrial Pi system, but into that enterprise Pi system, that sensor data. 
So they're also now starting to look at sensor data kind of coming in from other sources as well, other cloud sources. Right? So this is all kind of in context of getting these sensor data from different places for the benefit of you know, making the data visible for, for operational improvement, right? operational intelligence. So I end with another kind of architectural picture here. On the left-hand side has been the traditional kind of take sensor data, put it into a data infrastructure, analyze, and do all these great things that Pi does. Right? When we look at the Internet of Things, it's sensor data, leveraging more cloud technology, more sophisticated analytics. So you can kind of see our, 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 our spot where Pi is in that middle layer of data infrastructure. We see that it applies on the Internet of Things and all of that sensor data. As we talk to analysts, we recognize that that space is going to get more and more complicated, not less complicated. So the need for the data infrastructure is there. That's, that's what we're looking at. With that, I show you a picture of my favorite Internet of Things, my son. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope you had a very uh, good regional seminar. And I look forward to talking to you uh, outside afterwards if, if you have time. But I don't know if we have time for questions or if uh, we just wait till we do it outside. Thank you.